Who the hell are you? Raspberry Tart spat as she saw me. Who the hell, or what the hell, are you doing in my loft? How did you get past my guards? I had planted the litigating device, and had been in the hall, or been halfway out the door, when the stealth bug died. The tub of pony flesh wobbled around to face me from her place on the lounge bed behind her desk. Gizmo, get in here! I felt a pony move swiftly behind me, blocking my exit. Gizmo, escort our uninvited guest out. The bulbous pomegranate mare requested to the stallion behind me, preferably through a window. Wait, I said, thinking swiftly. I'm here about the contract on Black Seas. Raspberry Tart raised a mocking eyebrow. What contract? Ah, I remember you. You were standing in the background when our good mayor called me up to start slinging accusations. She hefted up one of her slab-like hooves, signaling the stallion behind me to wait. What do you want? The gears in my head spun. The pony who tried to kill the mayor was sloppy and stupid, and now the mayor trusts me. I gave her my best conspiring smile. I could do the job easily, and correctly, but it wouldn't be cheap. Raspberry Tart sighed. Do you really think I'm that stupid? Do you really think you could pull the wool over my eyes that easily? I found myself picturing an attempt to cool her with wool. The rolls of fat. The massive jowls. Not enough sheep in the world, I muttered aloud before I could stop myself. She rolled her eyes. You know, I really don't like being insulted, especially from home invaders. Gizmo, tear the little pony's legs off, wouldn't you? Oops. I cantered, circling to see Gizmo. My eyes widened as I took the surgical scars, took in the surgical stars and the mechanical wings. Gizmo was a cyber pony, almost certainly a refugee from Stable 101. Gizmo spun, spreading out his wings and slashing at me. I dodged to the side, the blades of those wings whisking through the air inches from my eyes. I couldn't guess if those cybernetic wings would actually allow the earth pony to fly like a pegasus, but the feathers were razor sharp. Gizmo somersaulted, his wings lifting and slicing through the air at me as I dove for cover, casting about for something to use as a weapon. Gizmo spun again and bucked, turning the chair I had moved behind in a battering ram to knock me over. My armor took the blow, leaving me winded but unhurt. Gizmo, stop playing with your food, Raspberry Tart ordered lazily. Just finish her already. I scrambled for the door. Gizmo jumped onto the couch and leapt into the air, spreading out his wings. Maybe he couldn't actually fly with them, but they allowed him to glide. He swooped across the room and landed on me with all hooves, driving me to the floor. I focused, my horn glowing. I was weak and weaponless, but I fought my way through Canterlot, damn it, and Old Olne. There was no way I was going to fall to some two-bit crook's augmented muck. I felt a hoof press down against the back of my head as Gizmo shifted so he could angle a wing at my neck. Then. I heard the squelching sound as I telekinetically drove my screwdriver down through his ear and into his brain. Gizmo collapsed off me, twitching. It took him almost a minute to die. Pushing myself back up, I turned towards Raspberry Tart. All right, let's try that again. Or I could just finish you off myself. I don't think you could, I snarked. I'm not a pie. My horn glowed as I levitated Gizmo's body, pointing one of the razor-sharp wings towards her broad throat. Now, one last time. Raspberry Tart took fresh stock of me. You might just be useful after all. Chief Lantern was waiting with the mayor when Calamity and I returned to Black Sea's supplies. Did you get all that? I asked. The moment I trotted through the door. Yes, Black Seas informed me, with a heavy tone, her expression cloudier than ever. I drew up short. This was not the demeanor of a mare who just had her rival floated to her on a silver platter. And almost immediately after, I got a, fall, a call from Raspberry Tart, reporting her attempt to barter for my murder. 
I stammered. Wait. What? I wasn't. I was just trying to get her to say something that I wasn't actually going to offer. Chief Lantern waved a hoof. Don't worry, girl. We know that. It would take an amazingly stupid assassin to negotiate a contract against a target she knew was listening through a device she planned herself. Oh. I breathed a sigh of relief. A raspberry tart covered her tail. She made it look like she was just playing along in order to bring another wannabe assassin to justice. We can't use anything she said against you. Clemity bristled. Well, how about that sick... or sick in that cyber pony on Little Pip? You were invading her home, she flattered told me. Anyway, it doesn't matter now, Mayor Black Seas claimed. We've got bigger problems. Clemity whined. What now? Mayor Black Seas moved over to the terminal. Just after she called us, Raspberry Tart made another call. She pressed a button. An unfamiliar stallion's voice sounded through the speaker. Hello? Who is this? Well, hello to you too, darling. Raspberry Tart's voice sithered. You shouldn't... <clears throat> um... We're all set for your visit. I've cleared the way. When your boys get here, the doors will be open and waiting for them. The package they're looking for doesn't suspect a thing. But we have had one small setback. Those aren't words I like. The stallion informed her coolly. You shouldn't be telling me words I don't like. Mayor Black sees is still going to be a problem, Raspberry Tart whined. The mayor and the security chief exchanged glances as they listened. I could hear a heavy sigh through the speaker. The mayor of that rusty monument you call a city was your responsibility. We're more than ready and capable of doing things the hard way, if met by any resistance. Ah, of course, Raspberry Tart said, sounding a little worried now. The stallion neighed. Personally, I would prefer it the hard way. Tends not to leave loose ends. No, that won't be necessary, darling. How long until we can expect your arrival? There was a snort from the unidentified stallion. Our raptors are eight minutes out. She'll give you plenty of time to fix your little problem, or flee the city. The Enclave was coming for Friendship City. I... I could just turn myself over to them, I offered meekly. The ponies gathered in the council room, with me staring appraisingly. <clears throat> what makes you think you're the one they're after? Dr. Freshwater asked, raising an eyebrow. Well, I grimaced. I had no reason for my assumption other than the timing, and the fact that it always seemed to be me. Who else would it be? Oh hell no, Calamity spat. He turned to the others. Y'all ain't had any o over any pony to the Enclave. He paused, his determination melting into hope. Are ya? The door opened behind us, and Chief Lantern marched in, followed by several security ponies. Raspberry Tart's gone. Looks like she took one of the boats. Good riddance, Mayor Black Sea snickered. We can't worry about her now. Question is, do we fight, evacuate, or both? Do we even have enough boats to evacuate every pony? Dr. Freshwater asked, turning to the security chief. The pony shook his head sadly. Maybe we did about five years ago, but not anymore. We can get maybe a third of the population packed into the boats we have. Slightly less seeing as Tart took one of them. To be fair, I noted disdainfully, she kind of took a whole one up herself. Clemity shook his head. If their target might be on one of those boats, they'll sink all of them. Chief Lantern growled. We fight then. That's what we have those harbor guns for. Dr. Freshwater looked at them. Are we seriously not going to put up negotiation on the table? Based on that recording, they only want one pony. How can we put the lives of every pony in the city at risk just for one? She stared at us, um, <clears throat> imploringly. Shouldn't we even ask who they want? And if it's you? Calamity nickered. Then what? The doctor frowned. Well, then I'll try to get away. Alone. Can we communicate with them on Raspberry Tart's terminal? I suggested. If the Enclave... If I was the Enclave's target, I was more than willing to give myself up to spare the city. And I was sure Calamity felt the same. 
but letting the Enclave close in on the city, where we had waited to find out who they were after felt like a tactical disaster. Not for the first time, I wondered what Steelhooves would recommend. Have recommended. The little point in my head reminded me, bringing heavy clouds of sorrow. Chief Lantern shook his head. Already tried that. They're not responding. Not a good sign. Sounds to me like they decided to do this the hard way now. Anyhow. I turned on my Pipuck radio, listening to the Enclave's overriding broadcast in my ear bloom. I didn't expect to glean any real clue as to what they were up to, but I felt I'd start to <clears throat> I'd start keeping appraised of what they were saying. For the moment, I was only getting dark, funeral-esque marching anthems. Steelhoof's funeral had been this morning. The loss of my friend wrapped my heart in chokingly tight sorrow, and the dour tones of the music were cutting at me with sharp metal wings. Calamity was off assisting Chief Lantern. A quick expression of the harbor guns had revealed sabotage, apparently part of Raspberry Tarts clearing the way for the Enclave. The damage had been inexpert, and Calamity was certain they could have at least half the harbor guns working before the Enclave arrived, but they would have to work fast. I followed Dr. Freshwater to the observation room and stared through the anti-radiation window. Greenish-yellow light poured out of the glass. Inside, Ditsidu saw me approach the window and waved a wing. A device mounted into the wall clickety-clicked, reading the ambient radiation inside the room. Let's try it again, one of the lab technicians, a cream-colored coat with a color flower blue mane, spoke into the microphone. Focus. The unicorn technician began to walk Ditsidu through the mental exercises that young unicorn fillies and colts used to practice telekinesis. But Itsy Doo wasn't a unicorn. She had no magic. What could they be expecting? Foosh! The radiation counter squealed as the light in the room became momentarily blinding. Itsy Doo tumbled to the floor comically, with a burst of energy out of her own body, knocking her off kilter. Oh, very good! The unicorn technician cheered into the microphone, clapping his hooves together in applause. Keep that up, and you'll be able to purge yourself of this radiation in a couple days. Inside the chamber, Ditsy Doo pranced joyfully. Now, let's go again, the unicorn said with a happy chuckle. But this time, try to keep centered so you don't keep knocking yourself over. I smiled at Ditsy Doo and applauded, too. Somehow, watching her joy made the storm clouds over my head scatter, if just for a while. The music in my ear bloom ended, and a voice began to speak. I turned away from the glass, listening. I didn't want Ditsy Doo to see the expression I expected to play across my face. Greetings, ponies, of the equestrian wasteland. The Grand Pegasus Enclave embraces our earthbound brothers and sisters. I know many of you are mournful for the loss of Canterlot, such an iconic symbol of the equestrian, of equestria that was. But the royal city was destroyed centuries ago, and all that remained was a breeding ground for monsters and poisons. Sometimes, in order to allow the body to heal, we must cut out the infected flesh. I could feel the scowl forming on my muzzle. I didn't like where this was going. It felt like more than just an excuse for their attack on the Canterlot ruins. Burn away the diseased areas before the infection can spread. I winced as a blast of static cut through the broadcast, nearly making my <clears throat> making me kick off my ear bloom. Good evening, children. DJ Pwn 3's voice burst over the airwaves. It's me again, your old pal, DJ Pwn 3, coming to you from a secret location somewhere in the Equestrian Wasteland. You didn't think I'd abandon the Equestrian Wasteland just because of the Enclave, did you, children? Now, old DJ Pwn 3 ain't got a lot of time before Big Sister Enclave shuts this down. So let's get right to it, shall we? That's right, the news. Yes, the little pony in my head was bouncing around gleefully, Yes, 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 yes! Now, first up, the truth about one down in Mariponi. Now, I've got my information from irrefutable sources here, children. And I've got to admit, the Enclave is right about one thing. The Goddess was as big and bad a threat as they're making her out to be. But that's where the truth stops, and the lies begin. Irrefutable sources. I'm assuming she meant she was been watching from the towers 
But wait. Now, I don't know what the Enclave were out at Maripony for, but it sure as hell wasn't to take out the biggest threat the Equestrian Wasteland has ever known. No, the deed was performed by none other than your and my favorite heroine, the Stable Dweller. My ears were burning, but I was too happy at hearing Homage's voice, disguised as it was, to mind. And the bomb she used to do it was the very one Red Eye was threatening Tampony Tower with for weeks. Turns out, our heroine talked to Red Eye into giving up his big trump card. Oh, irrefutable sources. Homage has watched my memories. So, that casts serious doubt on the whole Red Eye Goddess Alliance the Enclave has been spouting off about. They're lying to you, children. Plain and simple. Now, DJ Pwn3 still doesn't know what they're up to, but I can tell you this. The Grand Pegasus Enclave are not your friends. Now keep an ear out, cause I'll be. Another burst of static, and DJ Pwn3 was gone. I floated off the ear bloom and held it to my breast, basking in the knowledge that Homage was still out there, still alive, and fighting the good fight in her own very important way. Attention, citizens of Friendship City. The armor-altered voice boomed over the city's public address loudspeakers. We are here to take into custody a Pegasus, wanted for crimes against the Grand Pegasus Enclave. His name is Radar. You can recognize him by the following brand on his flank. I stared up at the nearest loudspeaker, the gray box attached to one of the support beams outside Sparkles. I had just made it back to the watering hole and was waiting for Calamity's return when the Enclave announcement started. I checked my pickbox clock. The Enclave was early. We had almost 20 more minutes. The mayor had made our own announcement, urging ponies to return to their homes less than 10 minutes ago. Mayor Blackseas had called it an exercise, knowing that panic would cost lives. But an exercise didn't have a lot of motivating power. The central chimney wasn't anywhere close to being cleared. Our raptors are 80 minutes out, but their armored troops were much faster. Failure to produce this Pegasus and turn him over to the Enclave will be considered an act of <clears throat> collusion. Prompt compliance will be rewarded. Refusal will be met with force. The ponies who had stopped to stare and listen began to panic. Ponies began racing up and down the stairs, pushing into each other. A cobalt-coated buck screamed as he was knocked over the railing, falling three stories to slam heavily into the ponies racing about the floors below. Somewhere, the voice of a scared foal cried out. I launched out of my seat, looking around for the source of the voice. With a bang, the doors into the central chimney swung open, and nightmarishly armored forms of the four enclave moved in, their scorpion-like tails curling slowly, the antenna-like integrated weapons of their enclave armor pulsing with colored light. Every pony, stay where you are, one of the pegasi said. We are the enclave. We are here to bring one pony to justice. Many ponies stopped, frozen in their tracks. Others raced for the nearest doors, diving inside. I could hear the full crying under the thousand or the hun thunder of hundreds of frightened whispers. We will be searching the premises, the Pegasus informed the crowd. Do not attempt to hide. Do not attempt to flee. Do not attempt to interfere. Obey and we will be out of your mains in short order. The Pegasus beside him stepped up as the two behind started fanning out, moving through the crowd. The Pegasus called out, Any opponent with information leading to the swift arrest of the Pegasus radar will be rewarded with a finder's fee of 5,000 bits. To their credit, not a single pony in Friendship City stepped up to take the offer. Fuck you, a mint-coated buck shouted, from the spiral above. The Enclave Pony looked at him, the gems on her armor glistening. Fzet! The ponies around the buck scattered as he was turned into a glistening pile of ash before their eyes. Two more ponies in the crowd broke into a run, trying to make the door of one of the steps. Fzet! Fzet! The glowing bolts of magical energy threaded the crowd, striking down their targets. One of the ponies vaporized, her ashes scattered across the door she was tr trying to reach. The other collapsed onto her side, screaming in pain. I repeat, do not attempt to hide. Do not attempt to flee. 
Do not attempt to interfere. Obey. I was trembling. If I had my sniper rifle, all four of them would be dead right now. One of the black-clad pegasi started to move through the patrons of Sparkles. She stepped closer to me, walking around behind me as she looked me over. I forced myself to stand there silently, knowing any action could put ponies in danger. She paused. Her visor turned towards the pit buck molded on my leg. Everfree wins, she whispered in revulsion, moving quickly past. I caught sight of the little, wine-colored filly curled up on the foot of the spiral stairs, shivering and whimpering. My heart went out to her. I started to inch closer, hoping I could comfort her. I made it halfway when she saw me, her eyes opening wide with utter horror. Hellmare! she screamed, scrambling up and fleeing from the sight of me. No. Fzat. No! The foal's momentum had carried the glistening pink ash as she glowed and disintegrated, fanning it out across the metal floor. My world shattered apart. I collapsed. My hooves raised to my muzzle, as if they could contain my screams. Brightwind, you shot a filly! My whole body was shaking, and I couldn't stop. The tears couldn't stop. Oh, goddesses, no. Fly steady, soldier. Fly steady? The second Pegasus rounded on the first. You just shot a filly! Hellmare. I'd killed the filly just as surely as Brightwind had. I'd killed her by trying to help. The image of her vanishing in a cloud of pinkish glitter kept playing over my mind. I couldn't think of anything else. The first Pegasus, Brightwind, turned to her accuser. We had our orders, and you will obey them. Now, fly steady. She wasn't running to warn, ra warn Radar or to hide him. She was just scared. I take it back. I cried out silently to Celestia and Luna. I take it back. I didn't try to help. I didn't let her see me. Please, bring her back. Please. Let me take it back. But no amount of regret or pleading with the goddesses would make up or would make the sparkling ash spiral upwards and be reborn in a flash of light. We can't know that, soldier. Brightwind insisted defensively. Now either shut up and fly steady, or get your tail back to the raptor, and I'll deal with you later. I didn't sign up for this, the Pegasus said, turning away from Brightwind and flying back the way they came. The thunder of the harbor guns signaled the arrival of the raptors. Friendship City had not given up the resident Dashite. The Enclave began a full attack at the 69th minute mark. I had crawled over to the ashes of the Aru Philly, gathering them with my telekinesis. That's as far as I'd gotten when Calamity found me, flying in loaded down with all our weapons. Lil Pip, what are you doing? He shouted as, he, as a lancing blast of crimson magical energy speared through the upper levels of the Pony of Friendship, slicing through homes and catwalks. The Pegasus grabbed me, dragging me away as the chunks of walkway and scaffolding came raining down. I... I couldn't find anything to put her in, I said, looking up into the eyes of my friend, showing him the glowing ball of ash wrapped gingerly in my magic. It was so small, it seemed hardly enough to be a filly. Calamity sat me down in the shelter of sparkles, as another blast from one of the raptor's magical energy cannons burnt a hole the size of a chariot through the side of the statue, engulfing warm smiles in. If there was any pony inside, they were incinerated within seconds by the fuchsia-colored flames. Clement to look at the ash I was holding, his bewilderment expression shifting to wounded understanding. He looked around and dug an empty sparkle cola bottle out of a trash bin. Here, little pip, put her in here. My world had become that ash. With gentle reverence, I magically funneled the filly into the bottle. It glowed a soft off pink. I floated out a bottle cap, screwing it on tight. Okay, little pip, she's taken care of, Clamity was telling me. Now, I need you back. I know it's hard, and I know it hurts, but we need you here right now. I stared at him, wondering how he could be so close, yet so far away. You understand me, little pip. All around us, ponies were fleeing in terror, trying to get to the exits. 
They didn't care that there weren't enough boats. The thundering of the harbor guns was thinning out. Calamity slapped me hard across the face with his forehoof. I gasped, lifting a hoof to my cheek in surprise. I could hear screams and explosions nearby. Pony's lives are counting on you, little pip, Calamity said, drawing my attention to a focus. Y'all gotta pull yourself together. Hurt tomorrow. Help today. I slowly nodded, coming to my senses, like a swimmer fighting her way to the ocean surface. Tucking the bottle of ash in my saddlebags, I looked at Calamity. W what can I do to help? Calamity smiled, looking ready to collapse in relief. They came in with three raptors, Radar told us, when we reached one of the sniper platforms in the crown of the Pony of Friendship. Harbor guns took out one of them. I looked into the sky as the two dark warships hovered over Friendship Island as dozens of pegasi swarmed about the statue. A Chief Lantern and two security ponies fired at the attacking Enclave soldiers as quickly as they could find targets, ducking behind low barricades as the pegasi returned fire. Besides me, Calamity swiftly assembled Spitfire's Thunder. The cannons of the, laugh of the left raptor flashed, sending magical energy blasts into the statue, tearing through its reinforced copper skin and into the city beyond. The other raptor floated impassively. That second raptor stopped firing after taking out the last of the harbor guns. Radar informed me. We need to take out the last raptor. Shaking his head, he added, Really wish I knew why they were so hot to get me. Radar looked at me apologetically. I would have gone out myself, but fresh water didn't let me. Threatened to shoot me if I did. He looked up. I'd go now, but it didn't matter anymore. He was right. The Enclave had gone this far. They weren't planning on leaving survivors. An Enclave Pegasus, pulling a war wagon, drove towards the ponies spilling out of the statue. With a kick of her hoof, a door beneath the wagon snapped open, and bombs began to fall. Helpless ponies below were rent apart, their bodies flung by tatters of detonations of savage energy. Calamity stood up, taking aim. Spitfire's thunder tore through the air, a shot piercing the war wagon. The explosion ripped apart the sky. Good shot. Calamity praised, gently. Calamity was breathing heavily, looking near tears himself. Not fast enough. Ain't none of this worth me, Radar said. I followed his gaze down to the blasted ground, bloodied with the shredded bodies of innocent ponies. The crushing grief that had overwhelmed my soul was breaking apart. I slowly replaced with a building war cry. This wasn't right. This was evil. And I had to stop it. I think you can turn this whole thing around if you can shut down the last raptor, Radar repeated. I'd do it myself, but... He looked down. Not as fit as I used to be. Looking up again, he added, and not a word of that to Dr. Freshwater. You hear me? We'll do it, I told Radar. Turning to Calamity, I have a plan. I stared at the burning wreckage of the docks. The Enclave had bombed the ships. No pony was getting off the island by boat. The delivery wagon, for absolutely everything, was scattered in burning fragments across the water and along the sagging, demolished piers. I looked at Ditsy Do. In, in emphatic horror, but the glowing ghoul merely shrugged, writing, It's just a wagon, on her chalkboard. As the glowing pegasus flew out of, over the devastation, Mize caught something crimson and green floating in the water, a pony's forehoof, bloody and ragged. A memory bubbled to the surface of my brain. Help me! Ambrose had rasped. She had been dying inside her armor pinned by part of the terminal bank, half sunk into the tainted water that was spraying into the room, her body already twisted and malformed. I hadn't been able to reach her. I had barely been quick enough, spreading Zenith's goop over the ragged stump of my hind leg before I had bled out. I downed every healing potion I had, but the loss of blood had left me so weak and dizzy I couldn't levitate anything heavier than one of the coffee cups. My blood had left a wet crimson river pouring down from beneath the slab that was holding me down, flowing down into the tainted water, 
making it pink in the light of my pit buck. Help me, she had whimpered, her voice filled with torment. Please, kill me. I had wanted to. For the love of merciful Celestia, I had wanted to. But shy of trying to beat her to death with a coffee cup, there had been nothing I could do. Then a voice in my head reminded me that wasn't true. There was one thing I could do. I remembered, focusing my magic, lifting up her visor. Her eyes hadn't been in the right places anymore. Only one of them, <clears throat> engorged and strange, still stared out at me, tortured beyond the telling of it. As I stood near the docks, watching the bobbing severed hoof, I recalled thinking, maybe not a sword, but there is enough blood for a dagger. <clears throat> the memory broke, leaving me shaken. I tried to dredge up what had happened next, but there was only blackness where the memory should have been. It took her less than a minute, fluttering about the debris and floating crates, before our friend the ghoul returned to me, her eyes looking in different directions, a smile on her muzzle and a stealth buck in her hoof. She shook my... <clears throat> I shook myself with a morbid retrieve, and that of the stealth buck to the other equipment I had acquisitioned. I shuddered. What had happened to me that I could look a poor pony's dismembered stump and not want to scream? The equestrian wasteland had poisoned my soul. Above us, the hostile raptor fired a <clears throat> blast at the crown of the Pony of Friendship, engulfing one of the sniper platforms in deadly magic. I pulled it to do with me, taking cover against the copper ropes of the statue as chunks of burning flesh rained down. Calamity swooped <clears throat> next to us, dodging falling debris as he dropped two sets of enclave armor at my hooves. Scavenged from the bodies of Pegasi, taken out by the snipers. Two, I asked him. I can't wear one of those. I pointed out dryly. Horn, no wings. Did he do, dragging with a hoof. What? My eyes widened as I literally put two and two together. Wait, Ditsy, you can't come with us. We're going to get into a fight. She lived 200 years, Clamid reminded me. I reckon she can take care of herself. Lil' Miss, two month old out of the stable. Ditsy do leveled a look at me as explosions shook the island. Clemity hefted up Spitfire's thunder, searching for the war wagon on a bombing run. Okay, fine, you're coming. I acquested, locking the stealth buck into my pip leg, and locking everything we had we weren't <clears throat> that we weren't taking, including Clemity's battle saddle, in a nearby crate. Suit up. The Tudu gave me a one hoofed salute and started dressing, hiding her brilliant ghoulish body completely inside the black insectoid armor. This is Raptor Primo Cumulus to Raptor Alto Stratus. Respond immediately. As Calamity and Ditsidu disguised on Cliff soldiers, flew us closer to the black maw of the attacking Raptor hangar. My pip leg had latched onto a new signal, one that wasn't playing the Enclave's continuous broadcast, and decrypted it. I found myself listening to the Pegasi inner warship military frequency. This is Commander Thundershear of the Raptor Pyrocumulus to Commander Icebreak of the Raptor Altostratus. Why have you stopped firing? The authoritative voice of the commanding mayor asked, clearly attempting to communicate with the unresponsive second Raptor. You are required to respond. Calamity landed on the raptor's right <coughs> flight deck, dropping my invisible self and the sacks I was carrying onto the black metal floor, lined with small, pulsing guide lights. He trotted up to the hangar door, looked over an access terminal. I moved, moved up next to him, the to-do watching our flanks, as he attempted to hack into it. As expected, the access terminal had a cloud interface. I could offer him advice, but once again I was denied a chance to do it myself. Commander Thundershear, this is Commander Icebreak. The enemy is defenseless. The battle has been won. Raptor Alto Stratus is standing down. A second Pegasus mayor replied in a dignified, reserved voice. A wing is standing by to retrieve the prisoner as soon as Raptor Pyrocumulus disengages. 
the to-do gave a little dance in her armor. Apparently, she was picking up the transmission too. The rebellion of the second raptor filled her heart with delight. I almost got it, Calamity Art grunted. I turned back to the terminal, scanning the lines of code he had brought up. Somewhere in that matrix was the password. Commander Icebreak, these are not your orders. Resume firing. With all due respect, Commander Thundershear. No. After two failed tries, we located the correct password. Um, Premastum. The heavy blast doors sealed the hangar, slid open. Inside, the high ceiling was laced with humming lights identical to those I grew used to in Stable 2, but more sparsely placed, leaving the hangar feeling dark and cold. Large, heavy armored windows along the roof let in the gray twilight of late evening between mounted magical energy turrets. I imagined that the hangar would have been bright and almost pleasant if those windows weren't letting in the pure sunlight of midday above the cloud curtain. Enclave technicians and internal soldiers wearing the light combat version of the Enclave armor moved around briskly. Rows of war wagons lined the edges of the hangar. Red fireboxes were mounted at intervals along the wall. Racks of bombs stood between the observation windows on the far back. On the other side, the Enclave officers split their attention between watching the hangar and monitoring the war chatter. Damn it, ice break! Operation Cauterize is in effect. This is straight from the High Enclave Council, the mayor commanded. The raptor that we had boarded reminded her peer. You have your orders. Now lock on targets and resume firing, or you and your entire crew will be guilty of disaffection. Did you do and Calamity moved off together, moving like they had a purpose, like they belonged. As long as they didn't do anything suspicious, they should be ignored. Meanwhile, while galloping silently towards the first war wagon, I only had one standard stealth box worth of time to do this, and I already spent half of that just getting up here and inside. Raptor Primo Pyrocumulus. The ponies of Raptor Allostratus regret to inform you that we will not slaughter helpless ground ponies, no matter what our orders say. I reached the first wagon and bucked the switch that opened its bomb door, floating out two of the homemade bombs of the first sack. I wedged them up next to the war wagon's payload. The bombs had been built using the schematics for the bottle cap mine that it to do had given me. It felt like ages ago. But instead of cherry bombs and bottle caps, these lunchboxes carried explosive munitions used in the now destroyed smaller caliber harbor guns. Mayor Blacksees had detonated or donated the supplies. They to do would help me make them. A lot of them. <laughs> Commander Thundershear spat in disbelief as I moved to the next war wagon. By our great leaders, this is mutiny, Icebreak. Think about what you're doing. You'll have your crew for treason. There was no reason for Commander Icebreak or the other raptor. R response. <clears throat> I planted two more bombs and moved to a third war wagon. Shadows played across the hangar. I looked up, watching through the ceiling windows as the large ma magical energy cannons mounted on the raptor's top deck swerveled to the left. I could hear the belly-mounted cannons firing on Friendship City. Raptor Allostratus. This is Raptor Promocumulus. The commander barked. You will lock your targets and resume firing, or we will fire on you. Finishing the third wagon, I dashed to the first of the bomb racks, setting bombs as quickly as I could. I spared a glance towards Calamity and Ditsy Doo. They had been waylaid by an enclave officer, who was demanding something of our speechless ghoul. She can't talk, Calamity was saying, prefaciously swiftly. Battle wound to the throat. Beside him, Ditsy Doo nodded, eagerly backing Calamity's story. Look, I'm her CEO, so anything you need to ask her, you can ask me. The Enclave soldier, officer, a youthful greybuck with a black mane and quill for a cutie mark, looked between the two disguised friends, insisting, We don't have any soldiers on Raptor Pyrocumulus with that kind of injury. 
He stared at Calamity suspiciously. And I don't recognize that accent. Where did you say you were from again? Every point in the hangar froze, turning their gazes upwards as Raptor Primal Cumulus fired against her sister. I scrambled to place the makeshift explosives on the second and third bomb racks. I was getting close to where the officer was interrogating my Pegasus friend. Calamity flapped his wings in irritation. Look, he grumbled. We're from the Allostratus. Commander over there has gone disloyal. We got out when we could. Well, that's to be commended, the buck told him, wrenching his eyes from the windows above. But under the circumstances, I'm afraid I'm going to have to place you both in the brig till the battle's over. The young officer reveled in place, looking for the closest soldiers. Your loyalties will be determined by a tribunal once we are cloudside again. Ah, hell, Calamity hissed as he stepped back striking down the officer with a sting of his armored tail. Dipsy Doo backtrotted, her body language betraying shock. Time to go! Calamity shouted as bolts of colored light whisked throughout the hangar, the soldiers in defense turrets reacting swiftly. I floated the signal detonator out next to me, dropping the sack of lunchbox explosives at the base of the last bomb rack and galloping. Beams of magical energy struck at Dipsy Doo and Calamity, peeling away at the protective magical-powered armor. One of the shots disintegrated a plate of Ditsy Doo's armor, the sickly yellow-green light of her irradiated ghoul body shining out of the hole in the black carapace. I kicked the stealth buck out of my pip leg, giving the turrets and soldiers another target. Thunder rumbled through the hangar from inside, or outside, as one of the pyrocumulus's cannons struck something vital in the Allostratus. Calamity and Ditsy Doo shot out of the hangar, several pegasi in hot pursuit. I felt the first scorching blast lance off my canterlot police armor, sizzling it as I reached the landing platform. I wrapped myself in my magic, making myself weightless, and jumped. Beneath us, the canted form of Raptor Allostratus was billowing smoke, its left side thundercloud dispersed. Gaping holes glowing in its framework as it dropped slowly out of the sky. One of the Pyrocumulus's belly cannons swiveled and fired on the ruined warship as it crashed into the friendship bridge, tearing apart catastrophically. I triggered the detonation. Behind me, light and heat erupted from the hangar of the Pyrocumulus. The dragonic roaring building with a cascade of explosions. A blast of fire buffeted me, setting me spinning through the sky my magic imploding as the bomb racks went up like volcanic Armageddon, magical fire rendering the Enclave warship in half. This time, it was Dizzy Dew who caught me. Her Enclave armor was peripherated, her helmet gone. Glowing ichor sleeped out of numerous painful wounds, but she was grinning, one of her eyes staring at me as she gave a squeaky victory cheer. My heart jumped and lifted at her jubilations, but then sank again as I looked out over the burning Pony of Friendship, the smoke of an incinerated city, and murdered ponies blackly bellowed out of the glowing wounds carved by the destructive magic. magic. <coughs> Energy. We almost made it to Fetlock before the Enclave caught us. It was the dead of night. Thunderclouds above rumbled angrily, still threatening a terrible storm. We had fled Friendship Island, after magically uh, snatching up the crate with all our belongings, drawing off as many of the remaining Enclave soldiers as we could. Most of them had abandoned the fight when all their warships had fallen, but a few had been determined enough to continue mop-up, and were engaged by the remaining security ponies. Thanks to our help, a little over the quarter of Friendship's population had survived. Raider and Chief Lantern were not amongst the living. Both were killed when the Pyrocumulus took out their sniper platform. Calamity had become withdrawn and laconic since the news. The survivors were still trapped on the island. The Pyrocumulus had destroyed the docks and boats. The crash of the Allostratus had wiped out a section of the bridge. Once we had gotten back to Stable 29, we intended to enlist the aid of Applejack's rangers. It was certainly but it was certain that the needs of nearly 200 suffering ponies would draw Velvet Remedy out of her shell. 
but Itsidu was wounded. More than she let on. As we drew close to the edge of Manhattan, she began to flagging. Soon we landed in the ruins of a building, which, based on the plate of silverware designed, or still visible, on the balladly deteriorated and half-buried sign, had once been a diner. Or, from the horseshoe motif running along the top of its still standing wall, possibly a horseshoe shop. When the ruins had turned up empty, Calamity had taken Spitfire's thunder and had flown into the rubble of an apartment building next door, searching for food, right away, and anything else he could find. This left me sitting on the edge of the ruins, staring across the street. Yatsidu had discarded the ruined enclave armor, and was splashing playfully in a glowing puddle of radioactive waste, spilling from the back of a wagon, bearing an MAS logo. I couldn't help a smile at her antics, as the glowing ghoul rolled in the waste, the radiation healing her wounds. This wasn't helping her condition, but now that the doctors of Friendship City had taught her how to relieve herself of the build-up quickly, Yatsidu was considerably less worried. Catching my eyes, she shook herself off, flinging glowing gloop all over the wagon and the rubble around her, then began to trot back to me, closing her eyes and concentrating as she did so. Her body pulsed with a flash of radiation that drove her face planting into a broken asphalt on the street. She stood back up, her eyes reeled in different directions, then giggled at her own clumsiness. As she reached me, she set down her chalkboard, scribbled out, absolutely everything, does not have boats, must fix. Don't worry, I assured her. We'll get those ponies to safety. But Zidu nodded happily and kicked her chalkboard up, dipping her head like expertly, dipping her head and expertly catching the neck loop so that it hung again against her fleshy breast. Do not move. The armor augmented voice cut through the darkness. I immediately cursed myself, bringing up my eyes forward sparkle. We have you surrounded. There were red lights all over my compass. I looked towards the crate that still held most of my weapons. I had retrieved little Macintosh, but the zebra rifle and sniper rifle were still inside. I did a quick mental calculation on how many armor-piercing bullets I had left in my favorite gun, how long it would take to reload, and the circums and the chances that my that they would kill my now unarmored ghoul companion before I could take them down. With a heavy sigh. I responded. We surrender. Tetsudu poked at the blue field of our magical energy cage with a hoof, making an ow sound, something she didn't need a tongue for. I stared through the field at the Enclave soldiers milling about outside. A technician pegasus sat next to the terminal, which controlled the energy cages. There were others, but ours was the only one still occupied. I noted glumly that it had a cloud interface. Next to it was an enclave crate where little Macintosh was imprisoned. My pet buck was clicking steadily. Being locked in here with Ditsy Doo was bathing me in radiation. I noticed glumly that the scrapes and bruises I had acquired in Friendship City were all fading away, and my stomach was beginning to churn unpleasantly, threatening to divest me of my previous lunch. Poke. Ow. Poke. Ow. These ponies aren't from the attack on Friendship City, I observed a, with a whisper, catching an enclave soldier tossing her emptied bottle of sunrise sarsaparilla into a trash bin that was beginning to overflow. I had against an enclave antenna array as they marched up to the cages. We've been camped here for a while now, I looked at Ditsy Doo. Any guesses as to what they're up to? The Tidu looked at me and shook her head, the last whips of her mane flapping out. Then, she turned back to the blue, cracked wall in front of her. Poke. Ow! A mustard-colored pegasus in the light enclave armor, identical, I noted, to the armor I had first seen Rainbow Dash showing off to her friends, stopped his walking patrol to lift his visor and glare at the Tidu. Would you cut that up now? He growled. Y'all are giving me a headache. Poke. Ow. Hey, he barked at me. Can you make your little monster knock it off? Nope, I replied, as I caught movement in the corner of my eye. 
Gazing out, I saw Calamity moving up on a high edge of rubble. Our cavalry had arrived. I shifted away and lowered my head, trying to look forlorn and pathetic, burying my face in my hooves to allow myself to serendipitously watch Calamity without alerting any of the ponies, keeping an eye on us. Calamity shifted Spitfire's thunder into position, peering down the scope at the pegasi around us. I waited, my nerves alive with anticipation. Calamity stared at the other pegasi and did not fire. Calamity, I whispered to myself. Slowly, Calamity pulled back, sliding Spitfire's thunder away and disappeared. This dude dropped his chalkboard her chalkboard next to me. He isn't going to rescue us? Calamity, I thought, feeling apprehensive and a little hurt. What are you doing? Two pegasi wearing fearsome onyx armor marched Calamity into the camp at the tips of their various uh, sharp tails. The rush-colored dashite walked in front of them, wings held high. Oh, damn it, Calamity. Up you go, one of the pegasi ordered as the technician lowered the field around one of the magical energy cages. She prodded Calamity to the platform. He cantered around to stare at her as the blue field washed over them. I moved as close to him as our cage would allow. The shielded cage was beginning to feel uncomfortably warm. Calamity, I hissed. What? Calamity looked at me sadly. Sorry, little pip. I... I just couldn't. Even after what they just did? Are you serious? Calamity shifted uncomfortably and nodded, offering him no explanation. But an explanation was forthcoming. Well, look who we have here! It was the Pegasus Buck who had growled at Ditsy Doo. He was trotting up, looking like a colt who had just gotten his cutie mark. If it ain't my little brony! His little what now? Hello, Pride, Clemity said dourly. I see they're still letting just any pony into the Enclave these days. Hey, the mustard-coated pony hissed. I ain't the traitor here. No, Clemity jabbed. Y'all just washed out. Three times, no less. You know him? I asked. Pride turned to me with a grin. Oh, are y'all friends? He looked from Calamity to us, and back, in exaggerated astonishment. Well, what do you know? A little Calamity actually managed to make some friends. He rolled his eyes, adding, A munchkin mare and a monster. Pride smirked at us. Y'all should really choose better friends, the Enclave Buck said nastily. Calamity here's a flying disaster. Leaning close to me, just beyond that blue field, Pride nickered like he was about to tell me a secret. I stood up, glaring through the magical energy barrier. You know why father named him Calamity? The Buck shot, or asked far too loudly. Father? Pride was Calamity's brother? No wonder he wouldn't shoot. I suddenly flashed back to the first argument Velvet Remedy had had about us eating meat. Oh, we can eat meat all right. You just don't like too much. Ain't really good for our diet. Calamity had asserted. My brothers used to challenge me to hot dog eating contests. Which mostly meant them shoving them disgusting things down my throat. Calamity's brother grinned maliciously. Cause he killed our mother coming out. I dropped back on my haunches, the cruelty of pride's claim knocking the wind out of me. The little pony in my head cried at the pain such vivacious words must be having on my best friend. But Calamity looked only bored. That again? He drawled, unimpressed. You ain't seen me for six years, and in all that time, y'all ain't never come up with nothing new? The orange maiden Pegasus shook his head. Back when I was a blank planted colt, and y'all would tell me that, I'd ball for hours. But case you ain't noticed, that was a long time ago. And I ain't a little fool anymore. Pride sneered. Really? Strange. I don't see no cutie mark on you, baby brother. 
Clemmie rolled his eyes. And you know why, he spat. The mustard-coated enclave pony laughed, stomping a hoof on the ground. That I do. He peered in Calamity's eye, cage, at his little brother. And I should be thanking you, branding that mark off your flanks with my rite of passage into the enclave. I reeled. Calamity's own brother had branded off his cutie mark? Then again, y'all should be thanking me, Pride snarked. Who wants a picture of a hammer on their flank anyway? He swiveled back to Calamity. Ow, that's got a sting, knowing you abandoned your own kind, becoming a filthy traitor. When all you had to do was wait a few more years? My loyalty was, and always has been, to the ponies of Equestria, Calamity glared back. A my fault the Uncle's allegiance is only to itself. If they were what they pretended to be, they'd have been down here with me. Still spouting them horse apples, little brother, Calamity jabbed. Well, in case y'all missed it, we're here now. So, Pride, Clemity asked tiredly, what's this really about? Because it ain't the Grand Pegasus Enclave swooping to the rescue, and I ain't seen a single civilian. This is a military operation, through and through. Pride nickered. Haven't y'all been listening to the radio? There's a bastard pony named Red Eyes who's messing with shit that ain't his to mess with. You mean the sing... Clemity quickly corrected himself. Sustainable Pegasus Project? Yep. Something he did alerted the higher-ups, and they started digging into all the shit he'd been doing with one of our towers. None too bright, that red eye. Left all sorts of clues as to what he'd been dipping his hooves in. I frowned. Careless wasn't red-eye's nature. On the other hoof, if the Enclave could override DJ Pontry's signal from the MAS EBS, they could very possibly be able to access things Red Eye reasonably expected to be secure. Or, Red Eye could have been setting them up somehow. From what I saw in Friendship City, the Enclave was sowing the seeds of their own destruction, just being here. And that was before taking into account what my friends and I were going to do to them. And what's it got to do with the blasted the blasting the royal city off the side of the mountain? Clemente questioned. Why don't y'all just fly over and kill them? What's Operation Cauterize? Pride pulled up short. Where'd you hear that? Now I have my sources, Clemity said cryptically, holding a hoof to his breast. Pride glared at my friend for a good spell before saying, Don't do the Enclave no good to just kill the bastard. Even if we take him down, some pony else might step into his hoof prints and try and finish what he started. So what? They had to take out Red Eye and Stern? To protect the Enclave and the Pegasus race, we gotta take out Red Eye. Those he may have told any pony else what he might know about the Sustainable Pegasus Project. Pride stated firmly, and get rid of the last Earthside hubs of the damn Ministry of Awesome so no pony else can ever stumble across what Red Eye did. Goddesses. That's why they were after Radar. He'd been in the MAW. There'd be Enclave troops hunting us down for the same reason. The gears in my mind started churning. How much was the target too? Why, who else? The little point in my head started piecing together a picture that filled me with dread. The Enclave had tried to wipe Friendship City off the map. Tends not to leave loose ends. The voice I now recognize as Commander Thundershear had said. He didn't want to just murder Radar. He might have also... He may have told other members of the science team, and they might have told friends or family. In Thundershear's mind, the whole city was infected, and they all had to perish. How many degrees of separation before the Enclave wouldn't consider Symphony a threat? How far were they planning to go? Y'all talking about mass murder, Calamity breathed. And only the Enclave thinks it can be Equestria's savior after this. His eyes narrowed, his gaze sharper than a dagger. But then, they don't ever plan to rejoin Equestria, do they? Try to give Calamity a pitying look. So, what's the plan then? Calamity stomped. The citizens gotta see something's up. The Enclave planning to write this off as a big scouting mission? Oh, we thought maybe it was time for us to descend, but after prolonged exploration, 
we realized it just isn't feasible. Best we wait another 200 years? Something like that, Pride said dismissively. We sat in our magical cages in silence as dawn began to color the horizon. I was supremely tired, but none of us actually felt like sleeping. Clamity apologized again, several times, in fact, until I had nearly shouted at him that it was okay. I'd spent the two hours, last two hours, contemplating how I could levitate the weapons I could get my magic on and use them to wipe out the camp. Right now, while most of it was asleep, I figured I had a good chance of pulling it off. But then, we'd still be stuck in these cages. I wiped the sweat from my forehead, tumbling slightly. My EFS had warned me that my radiation exposure had reached critical levels. I had to try something, but it would have to be something that worked. I wouldn't survive in here long enough to get another chance. Dipsy was huddled in the far corner of the cage, keeping away from me as best she could. But in this small place, it really didn't matter. Clamity was lying down in his cage, looking morse. I'm sure Pride was wrong, I told my friend, through the shield between us. About your father, I mean. He wouldn't have named you after the death of your mother. Clamity's muzzle gave me a weary smile. I never could bring myself to ask, but knowing my father, he probably did. Luna's mercy, that was horrible. I, I'm sorry, Calamity, but I kind of hate your father right now. Calamity smiled, sitting up. That's okay, little pip. He'd be happy to hear it. I winced. Every pony hates my father. That's his job. Most loathed bastard in all of the Enclave. Your father's in the Enclave, too? I breathed. My mind suddenly conjuring images of Calamity's father as a member of the High Enclave Council, possibly even the stallion behind the Operation Cauterize. Goddesses. Don't put Calamity through that. That's not fair. Yep, Calamity said. A grin. A grim little smile playing over his face. Drill Sergeant. At Nero. He stood up, raising his wings and dropping his voice mockingly. A hammer? Your cutie mark's a fucking hammer? Well, that better be a hammer to down your to hammer down your enemies, boy. Well you're the sorriest excuse for a son I ever had. Wow. Clemity sat back down, chuckling a little despite himself. Yep, that's my dad. He shook his mane, looking at me. Any surprise all four of his bucks ended up in the enclave? Suddenly my mother felt like a blessing. So, I said, trying to strike up a conversation while I searched for a solution for our predicament. Your cutie mark was a hammer? Clamity looked up. Yep, and a screwdriver. Your cutie mark was tools. It had not been what I expected. I had expected my friend to have crosshairs on his flank, or a bullseye. Although, that would hardly be the best thing to be sporting on your flank in the Equestrian Wasteland. Still, this was Calamity, the pony who had delighted at fixing up the Sky Bandit and making it fly again, who put on armor and a pony rack, who repaired everything from firearms to dresses. I thought of him as a sharpshooter, but thinking about it, I realized that every weapon he used aside from Spitfire's Thunder was a weapon he had modified or built himself. He either jerry-rigged his enclave armor to allow him to shoot it without wearing a helmet. Ditsy Doo trotted up, pressing her chalkboard against the shield, making it crackle. Clamity read, reading. Story? He looked at me, baffled. Cocking my head at Ditsy Doo, I guessed. I think she wants to hear your cutie mark story. With a smile, I added. I think I do too. Cutie marks don't matter, Calamity told us drearily. Come on, I encouraged, clapping my hooves on the floor of the cage. Story, story. Ditsy Doo joined in. Calamity rolled his eyes and shot me a look. Fine, but y'all gotta share yours too. He tipped his desperado hat, thinking. When I was a little colt, Calamity began. All I wanted to do was make my father proud of me. 
which was nearly impossible, even for my big brothers. I was never going to be as big or strong as them, so I practiced shooting. First year I tried at the Young Shar Sharpshooters competition, I came in third. Father was so disappointed. I winced. I tried to tell him that I tried my best, but he told me that meant my best was pathetic. I said it wasn't my fault, that the old gun he'd given me had all its weight funny and hard to aim. He told me that I should have fixed it better then. Clement shook his head, digging a hoof at the cell floor. So that's what I did. I spent all year tinkering with that gun, fixing the sights, building a custom muzzle grip, adding weight to the shoulder to brace so it would be more balanced. Next year, I placed first. Clement looked at me, tears in his eyes. That was the first time my father ever smiled at me. First time he told me I'd done good. He stared into the morning sky. The rising sun was painting the clouds with glorious oranges and pinks and golds. When I got home and took off my competitor's burden, there they were. A hammer and a screwdriver. Best day of my life. He looked down, reaching back a hoof to rifle his mane. Till I met you and Vel Remedy, of course. I was dead amongst, or dead last amongst my peers to get a cutie mark. I told them, all the other Colts and Phillies who had been in my class had gotten their cutie marks a full two years before, and the Overmare wanted to put me to work. I explained, normally in Stable Two, we would assign the jobs that would have been best for the rest of our lives based on our cutie marks. Without mine, the Overmare couldn't assign me. So she drew on some ancient bylaws created by Stable 2's foremost Overmare, which allowed her to have me temporarily apprenticed under various positions until something sparked my cutie mark to appear. Mostly, she had me try out for a number of administrative and technical apprenticeships, since those were the areas most unicorns were assigned to anyway. I looked down at the pit buck, grossly fused to my flesh on my leg. We were supposed to get our pit bucks after we got our cutie mark and our job assignment. Biting my lower lip, I thought back. One day, when I got apprenticed to the head pit buck technician, a worried couple slipped into the pit buck technician's stall. Their son had gotten missing. He had run off during his cutie mark party. Somehow, he'd gotten himself lost in the stable, and they couldn't find him. Clement was staring at me. A little bewildered, remembering how small and enclosed the stables were compared to the outside world. One of the most overlooked capabilities of a pit buck is that it can track tagged objects. Mostly, this is used for the auto mapper. Many pit buck, or my pit buck, came loaded with a whole slew of preset location tags. I'm still getting surprised by the occasional "you are here" messages on my eyes forward sparkle. I smiled a little. Remember how astonished I was that my pit buck knew the name of Sweet Apple Acres. Every pit buck has a tag, allowing any pony with that tag code and another pit buck to locate them. My mentor was asleep, which was not uncommon for him. So I hacked into his terminal and download, downloaded the tag code for the Colt's new pit buck into one of the ones that I had been working on. I took the tools that allowed me to unlock it and put the pit buck on bringing up the eyes forward sparkle for the first time. King the EFS compass to the Colt's tag, I slipped through the stable until I found him. The Colt had managed to get himself locked in the maintenance shed of the apple orchard. It was after hours, and no pony had been around to hear his banging and yelling. I didn't get, or I didn't want to get the Colt in trouble, so instead of fetching one of the gardener ponies, I picked the lock and got him out myself. I gave a weak grin. Of course, he went and told every pony how I rescued him, and so I got in trouble for appropriating the pit buck and picking the lock. But at least my mentor covered for me about the hacking, and the overmare wasn't going to press the issue, seeing as my new cutie mark uh, dictated that I'd be with him for a good long while. Smiling softly at the memory, I concluded, it was the first time I'd ever felt I'd done something useful, something really good. I don't think either of us had been expecting Ditsy Doo to join in on the storytelling as well. Hell, 
we couldn't even tell what the ghoul's cutie mark had been. So both Calamity and I were surprised when the glowing Pegasus dropped her chalkboard on the hoop at my hooves and prompted me to read. Then, prodding me harder, uh, reminded me to read aloud so Calamity could hear. It took a great many pauses while Ditsy Doo wiped the chalkboard clean and wrote a few more words before her, her simple story was told. Uncle owned a moving wagon company. Uncle let me help. He didn't let me do much, or uh, do much carrying, said I was clumsy, but he let me ride around on the wagon and called me his little mascot. I liked it. It was fun to help ponies move into a new home. I liked seeing them happy, especially families. Super, especially when they had fillies or colts my age. Once there was a family who was sad about moving. They had a little filly and a little or colt, but they were scared of me because my eyes were different. So I made funny faces and got them to laugh at me. Then they were happy. Then I took them back to where my uncle kept all the packing supplies and showed them the most fun thing in the entire world, bubble wrap. They loved popping all the bubbles, especially little Pokey. We had fun all day long. Uncle told me that was when I got my cutie mark, but I was having too much fun to notice. I had almost come up with a plan when Prize snuck up past our cages to the terminal. Poking it with a hoof, he brought down the walls of magical energy. Clemente jumped out, leaping off the cage platform. What the hey? Just go, Pride hissed. I whispered to Calamity, pointing at the enclave crate that little Macintosh were locked in. Open that, Calamity said, pointing his hoof, and we will. Pride gnashed his teeth in exasperation and went to work on the crate. So, Calamity said as the crate hissed open. I floated out little Macintosh and a few other items that had been taken from Ditsy Doo and me. We escaped? Something like that. I don't know, but y'all gotta get. Pride looked around nervously. Listen, word came down. Operation Cauterize has been extended to all Dashites. Next time I see ya, I'll be shooting ya. Understand? Calamity nodded. Gee, I had a sudden unnatural urge to hug ya, big brony. Dizzy Doo moved up, holding her chalkboard in her teeth with two words written across it. New Appaloosa. Pride gave us an ugly look. Red Eye's favorite trade in town? The one that gave him the bomb he set off, a satin named a member of our hot council. Enclave dispatched a full regiment to there at first light. Dizzy Doo stumbled back at the news, the chalkboard dropping from her open muzzle. Monster, Pride said darkly. I'd be surprised if there's even a crater left by now. Ditsy's eyes were wide, her pupils huge and centered dead ahead, seeing something beyond Pride, a strangling squeak coming from her throat. She didn't need to speak for me to know there was one thing on her mind, Silverbell. I heard the little lavender filly's voice from two days ago, crying out, Mommy! The to-do broke into flight, headed for New Appaloosa. Calamity scooped me up, giving chase, diverting only far enough for me to telekinetically scoop up Spitfire's thunder from the rubble where he'd left it. Four raptors were positioning themselves over New Appaloosa. Squads of black-armored pegasi flying about the sky between them. The town was still standing, but we could see the Enclave soldiers swooping to strike down ponies who were trying to flee the town walls. Ditsy Doo pulled up, hovering in the air, a look of dismay etched on her face. Calamity bristled, his eyes narrowing in anger as a pegasus dove after a worn running mare, opening up with a rapid-fire burst of light that turned the fleeing pony into glowing blue dust. Damn it! Little Pip! We gotta stop this! He was near the breaking point. I could hear it in his voice. Before we could react, Ditsy Doo zoomed forward again, flying right into the heart of the Enclave forces. The Pegasi whipped out, a whipped about as the glowing one shot past them. They started chasing her, but quickly stopped shooting after her, their first blast missed and hit one of the raptors. 
Clemity sent me down and started off after her. I grabbed him by the tail with my teeth. Whoa, that's suicide. I knew we were about to lose Ditsy Doo, and probably Zenith and Silverbell. I was damned if I was going to lose Calamity too. We needed a plan. Ditsy Doo had stopped in the center of the Enclave forces. They had been surrounded, but they couldn't shoot without risking hitting their own. Several armored Pegasi moved in. Their tails curled to strike as soon as they got within range. Foosh! The burst of light and radiation from the glowing Pegasi sent the encroaching Enclave Pegasi reeling as Ditsy Doo shot almost straight up in the air, beating her wings as fast and hard as she could. The Enclave Pegasi gave chase. They started to fire again, but Ditsy Doo repeatedly blasted out radiation, each time blinding her pursuers as it shot up, as she shot up higher. Two of the raptors swiveled their topside cannons around, scorching the air with magical death, but the huge weapons were too inaccurate to hit her quickly descending ascending target. After about a dozen missed shots, they left the escaped ghoul to the armored black soldiers, chasing her. The glow of Dithidu illuminated a path of the dark storm clouds as she disappeared into them. Then the glow faded, and she was gone. The ponies following her stopped, hovering in the air. Several had begun to turn back. Inside, I knew that she would, at any moment, break through the top of the cloud curtain and see sunlight for the first time in probably 200 years. The little pony in my head shed a tear. When reality snapped back, it's to do a distract of the Enclave. She'd given us a window, and we were missing it. Okay, I said quickly to Calamity, as I slipped the MG Stealth Buck 2 into my malformed pip leg. Here's the plan. Whoa, Calamity said, looking up. I turned, following his gaze, as a spot of golden green light dropped out of the clouds. I knew what it was, but I still lifted my binoculars to be sure. The first drops of the promised storm, promising storm began to fall. Ditsidu had broken back through the cloud curtain, shooting past the top tier of hovering Enclave soldiers before they could react. The ones who had started back down, turning, and sped in to catch her. Foosh! The pulse of radiation, light, sent the black armored pegasi spinning out of control as she shot ahead like a rocket. The other pegasus were reacting now, chasing after her, firing beams of multicolored light. Most missed. I gasped as Shum did not. Foosh! Did Tidu jolted ahead, moving even faster. She was aiming right for the center space between the Enclave Raptors. The Raptors were in position now. Their belly canyon, cannons were taking aim at New Appaloosa below, preparing to cleanse the town of the, off the face of Equestria. My plan was forgotten as quickly as I had formed it. All I could do was watch. Foosh! Ditsy was beyond the reach of her pursuers now, but not, it appeared, beyond the reach of their weapons. One of the Enclave ponies fired twin missiles at the ghoul Pegasus as she streaked by, seeming nothing more than a glowing blur. The missiles spun, magically locking onto her. They spiraled around each other, leaving a double helix of smoke in their wake as they chased her. Foosh! The missiles were und <coughs> undeterred and gaining speed, closing the distance as Ditsy Doo beat her wings, arrowing down at the Enclave about to destroy her town and kill her daughter. She was moving so fast the odd air in the equestrian wasteland seemed to be warping about her. Her body was glowing brighter and brighter as she focused, building up for another burst. The sickly light poured from her body and rippled in the air, shearing off of her in washes of unearthly, diseased colors. The missiles seemed to reach her at the same time she reached the raptors. Ditsy Doo exploded. Footnote. Maximum level. Quest perk added. Touched by taint. 3. Exposure to taint has further altered your physiology. You are 20% faster and stronger whenever you're basking in the warm glow of radiation. Your action points regenerate faster and faster the higher your level of radiation sickness becomes. Your natural lifespan 
has increased dramatically.